Lord Voldemort was a strong and powerful dark wizard in his own right, but he could never have caused such terror in the wizarding world without his loyal followers. Today we're going to look at the Death Eaters, where they came from, why they had that name, the impact they had on both wizarding wars, and what they did after both of Voldemort's downfalls. So get your wands at the ready, because this one gets dark. From an early age, Tom Riddle craved power, and to use that power to influence. When he discovered that he had magical powers before Dumbledore came to take him to Hogwarts, Riddle used his powers to hurt and steal from other children at the orphanage that he lived in. When he went to Hogwarts, this didn't change, although he certainly became more subtle about it. Voldemort was able to charm and manipulate other students into joining his group, which would later evolve to become the Death Eaters. For many people, a group like this would be considered friends, but not for Voldemort. Dumbledore recounts the early formation of this group in the Half-Blood Prince. As he moved up the school, he gathered about him a group of dedicated friends, I call them that for want of a better term. Although, as I have already indicated, Riddle undoubtedly felt no affection for any of them. This group had a kind of dark glamour within the castle. They were a motley collection, a mixture of the weak seeking protection, the ambitious seeking some shared glory, and the thuggish, gravitating towards a leader who could show them more refined forms of cruelty. In other words, they were the forerunners of the Death Eaters, and indeed some of them became the first Death Eaters after leaving Hogwarts. Voldemort, as strong and powerful as he was in his own right, knew that to achieve the things he wanted to, he needed a number of dedicated followers who shared in his ideals and wanted a taste of the power everybody seemed to know that he was destined for. So who was in this group? Well, people like Lucius Malfoy and Severus Snape certainly weren't old enough to be at school with Voldemort, but from Slughorn's memory in the Half-Blood Prince, we know that Avery and a member of the Lestrange family were likely two of them. Shortly after this, we also see the memory of Voldemort applying to become Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher, in which Dumbledore references that not Rosia, Mulciber, and Dolohov are also already following him around at this early point in his journey as a Dark Lord. This group were, with Voldemort, at the beginning and would become the earliest versions of the Death Eaters, though that wasn't their name originally. The Death Eaters were, according to J.K. Rowling, originally known as the Knights of Walpurgis, which is likely a reference to the celebration of Walpurgis Night, a night that, legend has it, demons and witches gather together. However, the name of the Knights of Walpurgis is never actually mentioned in the books. Instead, Dumbledore asks Voldemort in his job interview about his followers, who he says call themselves the Death Eaters at this point. But why Death Eaters? Well, there is a very clever and fitting reason as to why this would be the name of Voldemort's followers. Firstly, the name seems to derive from Voldemort's wand. Voldemort's wand is made from wood of a yew tree, and yew trees are commonly known as death-eating trees. Why? Well, firstly, because yew trees are highly poisonous, but also because yew trees were historically planted in graveyards. This was to deter farmers from taking animals through them, because the trees would poison any animals they took through the graveyards. The trees, when planted, would also have their roots burrow deeper and deeper into the ground, and because it's a graveyard, there would also be corpses in that ground, meaning the nutrients of the yew tree roots would take from the soil would actually be the nutrients that came from the decomposing bodies that had been buried. Yew trees were literally eating the dead. Hence the tree from which Voldemort's wand was made was literally a death-eating tree, and so the Death Eaters got their name. So before Harry Potter became the boy who lived and caused Voldemort's first downfall, we had the first Wizarding War, in which Voldemort and his Death Eaters took on the Ministry and the Order of the Phoenix. Voldemort's followers had grown massively over the years, and according to Lupin, they outnumbered the good guys by 20 to 1 in the first Wizarding War. Voldemort and the Death Eaters conducted stealth attacks, espionage, 
torture, and mass killings of both wizards and muggleborns, all as part of Voldemort's pursuit of power. We know that people like Augustus Rookwood, who had worked as an unspeakable in the Department of Mysteries, created a spy ring within the Ministry to pass valuable information to Voldemort. And additional information from Pottermore tells us that Fenrir Greyback, who loved more than anything to bite children and turn them into werewolves, was also weaponized by Voldemort as a means of threatening high-ranking Ministry officials. Although, because of the prejudice in Voldemort's ranks against werewolves, Greyback was never considered an actual Death Eater. We also know from Dumbledore's conversation with Fudge at the end of the Goblet of Fire that the First Wizarding War had giants on Voldemort's side too. The First War sounded brutal. Many members of the First Order of the Phoenix met gruesome and unfortunate downfalls. Benji Fenwick was discovered in pieces, Edgar Bones and his family were killed by Death Eaters, Caradoc Dearborn went missing, Dorcas Meadows was killed by Voldemort, and Molly Weasley's brothers Fabian and Gideon Pruitt, despite fighting like heroes according to Moody, were eventually killed by five Death Eaters. Voldemort had the numbers among his Death Eaters in the First Wizarding War, and he had the strategic advantage from all of his spies, both within the Ministry and within the Order of the Phoenix. According to Peter Pettigrew in The Prisoner of Azkaban, Voldemort seemed to be in a position during the First Wizarding War where he could not lose. The Dark Lord, you have no idea. He has weapons you can't imagine. He was taking over everywhere, gasped Pettigrew. It truly seemed like Voldemort and the Death Eaters' victory was only a matter of time. That is, until Harry Potter came along and Voldemort lost his powers. So we all know what happens next to Voldemort. He tries to murder an infant child and failed miserably. His soul, or what remained of it, was torn from his body, and he went missing for 13 years. But what of the remaining Death Eaters? Well, as you'd expect, many of them went to Azkaban. Bellatrix Lestrange, her husband Rodolphus, and his brother Robaston, as well as Barty Crouch Jr., were all captured and sent to the Wizarding Prison, but not before they had managed to torture the Longbottoms to the point of losing their minds. Lucius Malfoy managed to evade an Azkaban sentence by proclaiming he'd been under the Imperius curse and had been forced to work for Voldemort against his will. Igor Karkaroff also avoided a prison sentence by turning informant for the Ministry, turning in other Death Eaters, such as Augustus Rookwood and Barty Crouch Jr. And many other Death Eaters were cleared and acquitted too. McNair, Avery, Knott, Crabbe, and Goyle, as Fudge says, at the end of the Goblet of Fire. But from the graveyard scene at the end of the fourth book, we know from Voldemort's monologue that those who were acquitted never searched for Voldemort and never seeked to help him return. Instead, they were able to slip back into a normal life, pleading innocence, ignorance, and bewitchment. But as Voldemort returned and the Second War began, they rejoined him. The Second War seemed to take a similar route to the First, with Voldemort's forces operating stealthily and in the shadows. This is most evident from the Order of the Phoenix, where not only does Voldemort hide himself away, so most people doubt his return, but also his plans to steal the prophecy from the Department of Mysteries are extremely covert. The Death Eaters remained living as they had for the 13 years that Voldemort had been missing, secretly working on the tasks that Voldemort set out for them, sending people to recruit the giant just as Dumbledore tried with Hagrid from the Order of the Phoenix, trying to infiltrate the Ministry and topple it, orchestrating a mass breakout from Azkaban so that more of Voldemort's loyal Death Eaters can join his cause, and of course, recruiting the Dementors. All of this until eventually, at the end of the Half-Blood Prince, a series of dominoes begin to fall, eventually bringing the war out from the shadows. Dumbledore is killed, the Ministry falls and is controlled by Voldemort, Snape is appointed Headmaster of Hogwarts, laws to punish Muggleborns are introduced, and the Wizarding World plummets into its darkest hour. The Second War sees many casualties much like the first. Mad-Eye Moody, Rufus Scrimgeour, Ted Tonks, Dirk Cresswell, Dobby, Fred Weasley, Tonks, Lupin, Snape, and many, many more. The Death Eaters outman and outgun the Order of the Phoenix. And with the Ministry under Death Eater control, Hogwarts seems to be the last line of defense. That is, until Voldemort's defeat. But he isn't just defeated, he is humiliated. He once again thinks he's killed Harry Potter, parading him in front of his Death Eaters and enemies alike. 
but he hasn't killed Harry. And then in front of all of the Death Eaters, Harry tells Voldemort how he's been one step behind Dumbledore the entire time. And the Death Eaters panic. And then Bellatrix dies. And then Voldemort dies. And that's it for even the most loyal of the Death Eaters. They flee. Because without Voldemort, there are no Death Eaters. And since we've talked about a lot of deaths in this video, Lupin, Moody, Dobby, and more, why not check out this video, where I rank the saddest deaths in the Harry Potter series.